Hello, I am your host, Grayson Peralti. Welcome to another episode of SAE Tomorrow Today, a show about emerging technology and trends in mobility with leaders and innovators to make it all happen. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored to be joined by David Kim, Senior Vice President and Principal, WSP USA. On today's episode, he'll discuss road usage charging programs and zero emission buses for transit agencies. We hope you enjoy this episode. David, welcome to the podcast. Grayson, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to have you here. And today we're going to get into an interesting, debatable topic around roads and how we pay for roads. As consumers shift to electric vehicles last year in 2022 was the first time that 10% globally were electric vehicles. The gas tax is eroding. And we have the issue uh, around the United States, around decaying roads, bridges that are coming up on their, it's called their end of life need to be replaced. How are we going to re- replace the fees to make sure that when you drive on the road, oh, this is comfortable. And when you drive over the bridge, it worked. How are we going to do that? Yeah, well, well first of all, I just want to shatter some myths that might be out there. A, a road usage charge, or what we call RUC, would eventually replace the current motor fuels tax. And as you correctly pointed out, the gas tax, as we know it, is dying. And it's, it's dying a slow death, maybe uh, not so slow death. And when people find out that the main revenue source for building and maintaining our system of highways and bridges is about to become obsolete as a result of electric vehicles, people understand the need for a completely new way to fund our transportation system since EV owners don't pay a penny in gas taxes. They're getting a free ride. And people instinctively understand uh, that a system that relies on consumers buying gasoline simply cannot continue. And so I think we're on the verge of major transition in the years ahead. And while there may be some grumpiness out there in terms of paying fees and taxes, I think people get it. Well, here's, an, here's an interesting thing. I'm, I'm an EV owner. You, you mentioned so when you, when you I had a, a nice vehicle before, you go to the gas and you put gas in and there's a tax in there. N- not very transparent, but you're paying a tax there. Can you put a transparent tax on the charging around EVs when you when you plug it in and then you can generate revenue that way to pay for the roads? Are you referring to um, the, the the collection method or paying at the paying at the uh, EV charging station or, or or some other method? Paying at the EV EV charging station or even if you're plugging it into your home, and to me it just seems like it's a software problem to solve. You put a piece of software on there. You put in, I don't know. Let's just say you charged up 100 miles in your vehicle and. And it's X penny pennies per mile, and it's all done and calculated right there. I'll use the term at the pump, but at the at the charge. That is being looked at, and some states have passed legislation that would require some sort of fee to be imposed or enacted at the EV charging station. But I think a, a RUC system has uh, evolved, and it's a little more mature in terms of testing its viability and and doing it on a pilot basis in different states and. You know, one of the big advantages of RUC is that it doesn't require installing any roadside infrastructure. You compare that to a tolling system where you need things like toll transponder readers and license plate cameras, overhead gantries, vehicle sensors, grid power, and so much more. RUC doesn't need any of that stuff. It works simply by communicating directly from the vehicle to the cloud. And so vehicles would transmit their mileage to a third-party account manager, and then the RUC charge is calculated based on the information received from the vehicle. And that's either through a plug-in device or uh, vehicle telematics or simply by taking a picture of the odometer, odometer reading and uploading it. So it's pretty simple. And so that's the beauty of, of a RUC system. From a traditional telematics, or there's, a, there's a 4G car. Some cars have LTE. Some cars have 5G. And consumers pay anywhere from $9.99 a month to $19.99 a month. For that, and then there's other consumers that don't have the vehicles are older or, or, or can't afford to pay for it. How how can they engage in the system? Do they put in a device in, into their vehicle, or what solutions are there for those individuals? Right, there are a wide variety of options available to consumers. You can you can get a plug-in device. You plug it into the OBD2 port, which is what I do in Virginia. Or if your vehicle has telematics built in, that's another option. And then there's the low-tech option for those who have concerns about data, they can say, simply take a picture of their odometer and upload it. And of course, there are apps too. So there are, are a lot of different ways to collect mileage data uh, that do not necessarily require owning a brand new 2023 model model car. Is that data subpoenable? 
If somebody's trying, if, if you're going through a divorce or you're trying to figure something out, hey, you're driving an odd amount of miles. There's something going on here. I'm going to subpoena that data. Is that data subpoenable? Well, there, there is no question that privacy has come up as a major area of concern. And we are working with states to build the right systems from the start and to make sure there are sufficient security and privacy safeguards uh, in place when it comes to handling mileage data, as well as personally identifiable information. And so to get to your question, you know, states need to know how much to charge someone, but they do not need to know where they traveled. And of course, data has got to be protected at the highest possible level. And so there are very important steps that can and should be taken to address privacy concerns. So for example, the state agency should never receive the actual location of a vehicle only the third party account manager will have that information. Then the account manager will be required to purge all information, location information in a timely matter, manner, usually within 30 days of reconciling accounts. And then finally, it's really important for states to provide consumers with a wide variety of choices to report their mileage. As I mentioned earlier, everything from high tech solutions that use in vehicle data telematics or mobile apps to no tech solutions that rely on an odometer reading leave it up to individuals to decide which method they're most comfortable using. And so I think all of these measures will go a long way in terms of addressing privacy considerations. Who will be the, the third party account manager? Will that be the Googles, the Amazons of the world, or will that be a, a, a uh, let's call it a public private partnership or who will be that manager? That's really up, that's really up to the state to decide um, among the many vendors that are out there, companies that are out there that can provide end-to-end -end services, back office uh, services and operations, many operations, many vendors out there. And so that's really up to the state. And then we're seeing this debate around TikTok and data. We're, we're seeing a lot of uh, on energy and commerce uh, where you are in DC on the Hill. Are there, will the states put clauses in it that this data must be housed within the United States, do you think? I think, I would think so. And I think that's really up to the legislature to decide what kinds of policies and requirements will be a part of any state RUC system. And so theoretically, any state legislature could, could require data to be kept in the United States and not sent overseas or processed overseas. Certainly that's, that's a policy question that needs to be considered by policymakers and, and legislators. Because if you're offering options on how to gather the data, and this is hypothetical, as, as you said, as an active legislator, keep the data in the United States, or if you're, here, if you're in Virginia, there's a lot of Amazon data centers, for example, you keep it in that state. Does this come down to messaging where it's, hi, I bought an EV. No, now you're going to make me pay all these fees on top of the additional fee I had to pay for the EV. Does this come down to messaging it to the public? Absolutely. In fact, public outreach, communications, and marketing are key. What's really interesting is that based on public opinion surveys done, public acceptance of a road usage charge is pretty lukewarm. But when more and more people experience it as volunteers in, in state pilot programs, public acceptance goes way up. People realize, hey, this is pretty easy. This is seamless. It's, it's, not, it's not so onerous and it's simple. And you pay based on the miles you drive, very similar to the amount of electricity or gas you might use at your house. You know exactly how much you're paying based on your usage. It's all based on based on how much you use. And so people understand and experience the positive side of RUC once they volunteer in a pilot. And so what's exciting is that under the infrastructure law, USDOT will be doing a national pilot. And so the more people who experience RUC, the more public acceptance will go up. And so that's something to be excited about. You're participating in a pilot in Virginia, you're there using it, you use the Google term, you're eating your own dog food. <laughs> what are your experiences been on it? Well, I just signed up for it, so it's early to say, but the, the way it works in Virginia is for those who drive an electric vehicle or a fuel efficient vehicle, you have the option of paying the annual registration fee or you can voluntarily participate in their road usage charge program. I chose the latter. I just signed up for it, so it's it's early, but I'm excited. There's an app on my iPhone, and and so I'm excited to see what it's all about. I'm happy to be a guinea pig. I will say, when I lived in Sacramento, not too long ago, I had usage-based insurance, and it works much the same way. You pay for auto insurance based on the miles you drive, and so on your app, you can see how many miles you drive, 
and the app also shows you where you drove. I didn't have a problem with that because I, I was confident in, in the uh, company's ability to safeguard that information and not, not allow that to, to get out to the wrong people. So I'm excited about the Virginia Pilot. And, and again, I'm, I, I'm happy to be a guinea pig and, and see what it's like from a consumer standpoint. The, from the company standpoint, if the company, if the insurance company is held accountable, consumers can basically bankrupt them by doing a run on the stock if they they leak the data, so they're they're held accountable to shareholders. The government side, they're really not. I mean, they're accountable to taxpayers, but but not really. So you, you're running this in in Virginia. You opted to pay the 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 per mileage fee instead of the annual fee. What happens when you say you go over that fee or you hit that fee? Does does your road mileage does it does the fee stop or does it does it continue? In the case of the Virginia pilot, it's capped at the annual vehicle registration fee, which I think is two hundred dollars. And so, under this pilot road usage charge pilot, you're not going to pay more than two hundred dollars, more than what you would normally pay through the uh, vehicle registration fee. So it's capped at that at that level. So from a, from a cash basis, cash in, cash out, you're not going to lose anything. You're going to pay $200 regardless of uh, the method you choose, whether it's the registration fee or uh, the RUC pilot program. It'll be interesting to see if the cap stays at where it is or, or, or over time, the cap goes higher or it goes away. But you mentioned you lived in, in Sacramento and in California, WSP. You're working on a project with the California Department of Transportation on a per mile charging program in rural areas of the state. It's very interesting because California has a lot of unincorporated areas that aren't I'm part of part of a city that are unincorporated areas. 500 individuals are currently partaking in that program. What have you learned so far? Is there any really interesting trends in the in the data that came up or feedback from the participants that, aha, this is a big breakthrough for us. We learned something. Well, it just got started and it's a really exciting pilot program uh, that's looking at RUC from the standpoint of rural and tribal communities. And both of these communities have unique needs that could interact in different ways with RUC. And so we think it's really important to dive into these issues and gain a strong understanding of how RUC will impact motorists in rural and tribal areas and get their feedback. And so from our standpoint at WSP, we think this pilot will lead to important lessons learned that will help inform any future RUC approach. Uh, and especially in a way that will incorporate the needs of rural and tribal communities. So we're very excited to be a part of it, work with Caltrans, and I think we'll be in a position in about a year or so to to gain some lessons learned and hopefully apply that to future pilots. That's positive, and hopefully that knowledge and know-how can be passed on to other states as they look into rucks as well. Are there are the other forty nine states? Are they, there's a lot of rural area in Montana, Wyoming, Nebraska. Are they doing similar programs in states with lots of rural areas? Yes. In fact, Utah is, is one of the leading states when it comes to RUC pilot programs. And certainly we all know Utah has a lot of rural areas. And then parts of Oregon and Washington as well. Lots of rural areas, especially on the eastern side of, of those states. And I'm leaving out a few other states, but uh, Colorado, same thing. They're, they're deep into this. Minnesota, lots of rural areas and tribal communities as well. So in terms of terrain, uh, there is such a wide variety across all the states involved in these pilots. And I think over time, we're going to learn. We've learned a lot. We're going to learn more uh, in the years ahead. Fascinating you hi- highlight Utah. I was reading the other day, Utah is uh, lobbying Major League Baseball to get an expansion team there because it's one of the fastest growing states in the United States. And the Utah Jazz, from an attendance economic standpoint, has done very well for the city of Salt Lake. So you have a very fast growing state. You're, you're very progressive on on transportation, you're going to learn a lot there. You're going to learn a lot from California and the other areas with Ruck, and you mentioned there Virginia. Is the goal eventually to put all this together to have a standardized pricing where you're from California to Arizona, California to Nevada, or if you want to drive all the way to Utah as well, where the consumer knows, okay, so I'm in California. Okay, well, if I go into Arizona, it's going to be a lot more to drive, so I want to avoid that. Do we eventually get to the point where there's standardized pricing across the board? Well, you know, one of the great things with RUC is that it's a platform that can be designed in a wide variety of ways. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, the base case is that it can be set as a per mile fee to replace the gas tax. But the beauty of RUC is that it can do so much more than that. So, for example, it can know when you're traveling on a private road, so you're not charged for that travel. That's something the gas tax cannot do. So that's a huge plus for our farmers and ranchers. And then on top of that, you can design RUC to accomplish any number of policy objectives. You could vary the per mile rate 
based on the kind of vehicle you drive, the weight of your vehicle, and you could also reduce rates for lower income consumers. And I think we all know that the gas tax is highly regressive. It's the same rate for everyone. Doesn't matter who you are, what kind of car you drive, but a RUC system can be set up in a way that's equitable and sustainable. In fact, just the opposite of the gas tax, which is anything but transparent. So you have a transparent approach, but then on the other side, when I use the term across the aisle, you have bad guys. You have hackers that are always trying to outmaneuver and, and do all sorts of illicit activities. How do you avoid a consumer trying to avoid the gas tax? I'll give you an example in California. No license plate. You can drive with that. It says whatever the dealer is or the, the spray paint trick, you spray it on there. How do you av avoid that or limit your losses from the hackers that are going to spend all day and, and all night and do nothing to figure out until how they can bypass this? Yeah, I think you're asking about two things, hackers and compliance, how to avoid fair evasion, fair evasion. Let me take the second one first. If a driver doesn't pay their mileage fee, the state can exercise registration or title liens on a vehicle. It, the same way when it comes to unpaid tolls, that's what states do now. And so, that, so that's no different. When it comes to hackers, we know they're out there. And so we're working closely with states to make sure there are robust processes and functions put in place that will constantly search for and eliminate any potential electronic threat. Also want to point out that RUC systems have to go through multiple layers of certification and testing. Uh, in fact, they're required to comply with standards defined in NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Same with RUC payments that are made online. There are encryption formats and standards that need to be complied with. So I think it's a multi-layered approach to make sure or to minimize the, the prospect of hackers uh, intruding into systems. And of course, there are methods in place to, to address fare evasion or fee evasion, as the case may be. David, so you, you clearly define the issue of how, how to stay ahead of, of hackers. And I'm really curious, will the road uses tax, or you use the term ruck, will that be on all roads? Obviously, for if you're on a private road, you're not going to charge the, the ruck fee. But how about highways versus surface roads? Will it go to all roads, or will it only be on certain types of roads? This is outside of private property on, let's call them public roads. Yeah, so, so ruck is on RUC would apply to all public roads. And so RUC is different than a toll in that a toll applies only to designated roadways. That's a toll, but RUC would apply to all public roadways, whether you're driving on a highway or uh, city street or uh, other thoroughfare. Do we get to a point where a state needs to, if it's a, let's use California with the 405, for example, it's a very, you're coming in from the valley into downtown, into Los Angeles to go to the west side. It's highly traffic where they try and put a, a higher rock on there just because of the, the amount of traffic and perhaps there's a budget shortfall. Well, as a former Angelino, I'm really glad you brought up the 405 freeway in Sepulveda Boulevard. Very familiar with them. You know, it's really up to the state to determine, again, uh, what, what kind of, what kind of uh, rate you set. Is it based on the vehicle you drive? Is it based on time of day, uh, time of night? Is it based on, on uh, traffic and congestion levels? And it can be all of those things. But at, you know, at the same time, and not to get too far down into this rabbit hole, there is congestion pricing, which is really designed to manage congestion and to encourage drivers to seek other modes of transportation to get to, to, get to where they need to go. Whereas RUC is primarily seen as a way to replace the gas tax, but also can be used to accomplish other policy objectives, especially when it comes to equity and sustainability. So I know that's a little bit confusing, but um, the rate, it, bottom line is the rate really depends on, on how the state wants to approach that. Having lived in the Los Angeles area and you being an Angelino for many years, we just have to hope that it doesn't put the, the RUC on the 405 and not on Sepulveda because then everybody's going to go onto the surface streets and back it up. Correct. Well, I think in a, in a classic RUC system, there would be no diversion on Sepulveda Boulevard or any other uh, surface street as a cut through because the RUC would, would apply no matter where you're driving as long as it's not a private road. So if, if people <laughs> were to take Sepulveda Boulevard to avoid a fee, they would soon find out that it didn't save them any money. Uh, because again, RUC applies to all public roads, not just freeways. 
Yeah. And, and you know, and I both know at rush hour going down to Paul versus the four or five, is not going to make much of a difference in terms of, of time to get to your destination. Road use is tax. It's, it's clearly becoming a trend. It, it's, it's bubbling up. The other big trend that's only accelerating is the transition to electrification. And inside of that, there's the, there's the consumer adoption of the electric vehicles on the commercial side the class six, class eight trucks starting to electrify. And now you're starting to see buses, school buses, transit buses. They're they're looking this, and then they're giving out very bold statements to transition to electrification, especially the transit agencies. But there's a lot that goes into that. You can't just put out a press release say we're going to buy a bunch of electric buses and buy them. It doesn't work that way. There's a lot of infrastructure planning that goes a- along with that. From an infrastructure planning perspective, how can a, a, a transit fleet start the process of transitioning? from an ICE vehicle today, or if you want to use a natural gas bus, to an all-electric fleet tomorrow? Yeah, this transition is well underway, and a lot of transit agencies are off to a good start, but you hit the nail on the head. It is incredibly complicated, and it's not simply a matter of buying a bunch of electric buses, finding a place to plug them in, and off you go. Not as simple as that. And I know we don't have enough time to get into too much detail, but here are a few reasons why it's so damn complicated. Number one is geography and climate. Huge impact on bus operations as well as energy demand. There's also bus facilities and depots. Transit agencies need to plan and build brand new facilities to accommodate electric buses to not just to house them, but to maintain them and and charge them. Their current facilities are not designed for zero emission vehicles. And so this is a very expensive proposition. Then there's workforce training and development. Employees need to be thoroughly trained on how to operate an electric bus, how to maneuver them in just the right place when they need to be charged, how to maintain them, and so forth. You're basically training an entirely new category of employee. And then there's cost. All of this is incredibly expensive. And there are other daunting challenges. And while they can be overcome, uh, the transition will not happen overnight. And it's a very heavy lift for any transit agency regardless of size, I'm happy to say that at WSP, we are working hand in hand with a lot of transit agencies around the country to help them, to assist them as they make this transition. And so that's the exciting thing. This transition is underway. It will take time, but uh, this is this is underway and, and we're going to see a whole new fleet of buses in, in the coming years, zero emission buses. I'm going to, I'm going to put on my Disney hat here for a moment. It's magical. There's no noise. There's no pollution. It's, it's, it's magical. And that's a, a win for the environment. It's, it's a win for the individuals riding a bike by the bus or the individuals riding on that bus. Well, well, WSP, you're helping transition your clients to all electric buses. I have to go back to the infrastructure, the energy. There's another component to this utilities and you read a lot of public statements it's very hard to get a utility to move sometimes one and two it's hard to get the amount of energy you need how can these let's call them large-scale bus depots get the energy they need when they charge especially if it's during a peak energy usage period where they have to move an individual from point a to point b because that's the route time well that's the billion dollar question another very complicated element in this transition and Larger transit agencies will probably need to engage with more than one utility in order to provide service upgrades at bus depots and, of course, layover facilities. And transit agencies need assurances that there will be enough energy supply to meet demand. And it's pretty surprising how much power is needed at your typical bus depot, especially during peak usage, as you mentioned. And I don't have the numbers, but the bottom line is that it takes a lot of close collaboration between utilities and transit agencies to make sure energy needs can be met. And, you know, historically, utilities and transit agencies have had limited interaction with one another. So they're learning to speak each other's language and learning to engage with one another. And so this is a brand new area of collaboration. And we're going to see progress made in the years ahead, but it's brand new and there will be growing pains. But uh, that's what's going to be needed in order to make this transition and to make sure transit agencies have adequate supply to meet what will be huge demand. Do we get a, to the point in the future where we have a forward-looking transit agency that says, guess what? We're not going down. We have to move individuals no matter what time of the day it is. They start putting in microgrids, battery backup, 
let's use the, the the one Wilshire example going back to LA where they're pulling in fiber from Nevada. They're, they're, they're getting it from Arizona to ensure that the internet never goes down. Do we get a forward looking trans agency that potentially explores something similar to that to ensure that their operations never go down? It's got to be an all of the above strategy. Clearly working with local utilities uh, and then some microgrids, other sources of power and energy. I, th- I think that's the big concern. One of the big concerns among transit agencies, will there be enough supply to meet to de- meet, meet demand? And where is it going to come from? Can we rely on our local utility, whether it be publicly owned or privately owned, to meet our energy demands? And if not, where, where does it come from? That's sort of beyond the control of transportation agencies, but that's the kind of collaboration that will be required to make sure there are no shortages of electricity to meet demand. And then we have to have load balancing. If you're in a residential area or you're in an office park area, you have to make sure there's enough energy for the office park or the residents to charge the buses. And that's a whole nother element that goes into this. Does it all come down to properly planning if you're gonna if you're gonna put an all electric bus depot, hire WSP to ensure that it's properly planned, so you don't have one of these moments. Uh oh, something went wrong here. Absolutely, it's got to be carefully and meticulously planned. There are so many elements that go into the transition, as we as we discussed a, a few moments ago, and it's it's not a simple proposition, nor is it a cheap uh, and inexpensive proposition. So many attention, so many details to tend to. And, and so that's why it's as complicated as it is. But thankfully, that transition is underway and we're here to help agencies make that transition. And where does the capital come to, to fund this transition? Is it, from, is it from government grants? Is there a fund inside of DOT? Where does that capital come from? Well, thankfully, there are funding programs at the federal level thanks to the infrastructure law. And those funding programs are available for transit agencies to acquire zero emission vehicles. The Federal Transit Administration oversees those programs, and some states also have funding programs, including California. So funding is available for transit operators uh, that want to move in this direction and need funding for for buses as well as maintenance facilities and bus depots. In the Inflation Reduction Act, there's the, the Made in America clause. There's the, the transparency around the battery supply chain. As we all know, it's, it's common knowledge, the battery supply chain is murky. It, there's a lot of bad actors involved in there, and the Inflation Reduction Act is trying to stamp that out and add some transparency to it. But unfortunately, a lot of the electric buses today have materials in there that don't qualify for those tax breaks. Is that having a slowing effect? Or are you starting to see a transition where these companies say, oh, we, we got to clean up our supply chain? You know, it takes a long time, but are you starting to see some of those transitions come into place so they can achieve those tax breaks? I think this is a work in progress and the situation is evolving. And so for starters, there are more and more zero emission bus manufacturers here in the U.S. And at the same time, as you pointed out, there are supply chain challenges that impact vehicle delivery and battery requirements in the Inflation Reduction Act will probably have an impact on product availability, but it is literally changing in real time. And as long as the requirements are met, all of the funding programs created by the infrastructure law uh, we'll continue to help transit agencies make that transition to zero emission. Uh, but uh, more to come on that and uh, stay tuned. From an operational standpoint, I went to the workforce development, I'm operating the depot, and the, the bus comes in to charge. How long does it take to get to 80% or until that bus can get back into service? I don't have those factoids off the top of my head, but it, it does take some time. And that has to be factored into scheduling, maintenance schedules, as well as route scheduling. And as you mentioned, workforce, that's a, that's a huge issue. When I was Secretary of Transportation in California, I took a ride on a, on a uh, battery electric bus operated by Foothill Transit in the San Gabriel Valley of LA County. And the bus operator showed me all the meticulous moves he had to make to position that bus just right underneath the overhead chargers. He had to maneuver it in great detail, took a lot of skill. And it took a lot of training for him to be able to do that. And so I saw up front what it takes to, to position the bus the right way, get it underneath that overhead charger, and, and begin the charging process. So it's, it's, uh, it's quite a process. And it's, I would encourage you to check it out if you can and others as well. It's, it's something else. It's a very intricate, elaborate dance, if you will. 
while it's a process, if you look at the transition to zero emission buses in this case, it's going to create jobs because you're going to have to have an individual to manage the microgrid, an individual to, to, to build the depot. Is this another way to look at this? Is it looking as an economic development tool where, hey, look, we're going to create, you're going to have the temporary jobs to build the construction, but then you're going to have the operation jobs that you're going to need, and then you're going to have to have an individual to write the code to program the bus schedule and, and, and to maintain it. Yes, a- absolutely. There's no question that this will create a whole new industry, new new job classifications that barely exist today. And so new training and workforce development, new education, new curriculum, all of that is required or will be required in the years ahead as tra- as uh, transit buses make this transition to zero emission. So that's exciting. That's a, that's a really positive byproduct of uh, the transition. Obviously, the environmental benefits, but also economic benefits, job creation benefits. So there are so many benefits out there. Uh, with this transition. As, as we transition, you mentioned Foothill Transit. They're very forward-looking in, in their adoption of tra- of electric transit buses. How do you see electric transit buses rolling out? Do you see it mostly in, in California and then perhaps in New York? Do you kind of see it starting in pockets and then eventually expanding to other parts of the country? How do you see it rolling out? Well, there's no doubt that California agencies uh, are moving quickly because they are under a mandate to do so. By 2040, all transit buses need to be are required to be zero emissions so that's not a lot of time other states are adopting california standards and requirements and so you're seeing this all over the place but as we discussed earlier it's going to be a gradual transition for all the reasons we discussed it's so complicated so much goes into it but the work is underway and a lot of agencies are are well into it i will i also want to mention another transit agency in california orange county transportation authority they are deploying both battery electric as well as hydrogen fuel cell buses. And I saw their uh, hydrogen fueling facilities at one of their bus depots. It was fascinating. And I think they're doing this in order to determine and evaluate which technology will work better. It might turn out that both work, work well. There are advantages with hydrogen fuel cell over battery electric and vice versa. Both have strengths and weaknesses. So we're seeing that. And not just OCTA, but other agencies experiment with both types of technology. And so that's really exciting. You have to give Orange County a, a lot of credit because they're sitting there and they're learning. They're not picking a, well, you, were, you were in government, so you're not, you're not picking a winner or a loser. They're saying, okay, we're going to try both technologies and which one will work best to, to serve our constituents. That's something notable that other agencies can. Do you see other agencies, per, perhaps in Sacramento, Los Angeles, adopting that same as well since they're, they're neighbor with Orange County? Yes. Uh, and in fact, in other parts of the state, I believe AC Transit in Oakland, uh, Alameda County, also taking the same approach as Orange County Transportation Authority in terms of a, deploying both hydrogen fuel cell and battery electric. And I know I'm missing a few others, but uh, agencies, but more and more agencies are starting to do this. And I think it's a great way to, to glean lessons learned and to determine from an operational standpoint which technology might work better. And again, it might be, uh, there might be a, a room for both, but that's an experiment and that's underway. And I think there is a lot to be excited about as this continues. There's a lot to be excited about, but there's also a lot to learn. There's certain parts of California that are hilly or, or mountainous than other parts that tend to be flatter and be really interesting. Okay, hydrogen performs better in the mountains than battery, and perhaps we're going to put the hydrogen fuel cell here just because of the range and the... Yeah, but that's going to be a really interesting to learn there. Earlier, we, we talked about road usage. It's fees. I'm going to get back to that for a moment. Will these battery buses be subject to that? Will it be a pass-on cost to the rider, or will these buses be fully exempt from the road usage fees? Well, that's a decision for policymakers and legislators at the state and federal level. And there are many policy issues uh, yet to be decided and addressed, and this is certainly one of them. There's a lot of things that are going to be decided, but the bottom line is it's going to be a lot of fun. We're, we're transitioning to zero emissions. David, I, I love to know you got the background of Secretary of Transportation in California doing really great work at WSP. In your opinion, what is the future of transportation? <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to get on my soapbox. Um, (laughs) I firmly believe and hope that all of us will become far less reliant on solo driving. We live in a car-centric nation. That's reality. And that's the way our nation was built. That's the way cities were built. But it's having a detrimental impact on climate, safety, and equity. 
And what we need to do is encourage far greater mode shift, which is a technical term that means we need to travel more by transit and rail, walking and biking, micro mobility options like scooters and bikes. And of course, technology has its important place, but it's one tool in the toolbox. And transforming our built environment, no matter where you live, will take time. But I very much hope we're heading in that direction uh, because we need to move in that direction for the future of, of our climate, for safety, for sustainability, and for equity. Uh, we need to be on the cutting edge of that kind of transformation that we so desperately need. So now I'll get off my soapbox. The soapbox is, is, is a good place to be. It's a good place to pontificate. What we do know is that the future of transportation is changing. What we have today for transportation will not be what we have in the future. And David, as we look to wrap up this insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners to take away with them today? Well, we are on the verge of so much transformational change in the transportation world, whether it's how you pay for our roads and bridges, how you travel, how our built environment can change, how we advance equity through transportation decision-making and planning and project selection. This is a really exciting time to be in transportation and change, maybe even radical change, lies at the heart of everything uh, that is about to unfold in the years ahead. As David said, it is indeed exciting times. Today is tomorrow, tomorrow is today, the future is zero emissions. David, thank you so much for coming on SAE Tomorrow Today. Thank you, Grayson. Great talking to you. Thank you for listening to SAE Tomorrow Today. If you've enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, please kindly rate, review, and let us know what topics you'd like for us to explore next. Be sure to join us next week as we speak with Redwood Materials as they'll discuss battery cycling and the circular supply chain for electric vehicles. SAE International makes no representations as to the accuracy of the information presented in this podcast. The information and opinions are for general information only. SAE International does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast.